Hi, my name is Chloe Ronay, and this is a Conversations with Creatives visual podcast for Opus. This month, we're exploring the theme Cultivating Creativity with the help of Daniel Crissa, author of numerous books, including Your Inner Critic is a Big Jerk and Mastermind behind the contemporary art site The Jealous Curator. The beginning of a new year is the perfect time to plant some creative seeds for the coming months. But first, as Danielle says, we must weed out any seeds of doubt. In this episode, we'll be hearing from her alongside four other professional artists, Sandrine Pellissier, Thompson Brennan, Jane Kenyon and Sean Hunt, discovering how they overcome their own insecurities to make room for reimagining and experimentation. I started The Jealous Curator in 2009. It was completely for myself. I was just in a spiral of self-doubt. So I started writing in a positive way. And very quickly, like in the first month, I started to feel like that weight lift off of my shoulders. It was talking to other artists, especially the ones I really admired, to find out that these people who you just assume have it easy and ideas flow from them and you know find out they have inner critics they get blocked um made me just go oh my gosh there's all this freedom to do whatever i want like what why did i waste that time so my whole mission for the last probably you know eight years has been to not let anybody else waste the time that i wasted because it's pointless. I'm so curious about other artists and things that may, they may have planted in there that, you know, are wrong that they've had to like throw out so that they can make what they want to make. My name is Sandrine Pellissier. I am originally from France, as you can hear, probably. <laughs> I've been living in Canada for the last 20 plus years. I live in doubt. <laughs> I'm never sure about what I do. I always uh, self-criticize a lot. Um, often when I just finish something, I refrain myself from burning it or putting it in the garbage. Like I'm really bad with this. <laughs> uh, but I notice that if I wait long enough, I come to a more objective um, view of what I do. And usually the work grows on me and the more time passes, the more I like what I did. So I know better to not react impulsively and uh, destroy something I just made. (laughs) This is really extreme. I came to see it as a good thing because it pushes me to improve. Uh, because if I was always very satisfied of what I do, like uh, there would be no need to try to do better. I think it's about getting a different perspective. So you can get a different perspective in different ways. So one of the ways is time, like wait a bit and reassess. Another way is uh, scale. So for example, if I work on a big painting and I take a picture and I look at it as a thumbnail on my computer, uh, maybe I get a better perspective of what it looks like. Or sometimes I would take a drawing or painting and put it upside down or look at it in a mirror so I can see it differently. Um, I also like to ask uh, friends Because when you work on something, all you focus on is what you see as mistakes, but somebody looking at it with a fresh eye will not see that at all. So that's why I always wait before taking any decisions. So I could have something waiting a few days in my studio and I don't look at it. And then I come back to it. And uh, so, yeah, I, I guess the key is not to act on impulse. I read also about other artists saying the same thing. And I remember about an artist saying she had a magic drawer. So she would put everything she didn't like in the magic drawer and then she would open it later. And magically, it wasn't so bad anymore (laughs) just because she waited. I go to the studio um, almost every day, but I'm never without anything to do. Part of it is taking a risk, um, because if you keep doing the same thing with the same materials and the same subject and the same colors, personally, I get bored. 
So I need, every time I do something, I need to introduce at least something that is new. So there is a bit of risk taking and excitement in uh, taking that risk. Um, but on the other hand, I try to restrain myself a little bit so I'm not all around the place. Stressing takes a lot of energy. You don't realize how much it takes. And I could not work on paintings for a while because it was too much, too big of a project. But I still felt the need to create something because it makes me feel better um, to make art. But so the solution I found was to work on really simple project that could be done in less than one day with simple materials and very fast and easy for me. And uh, I did that for a while and uh, it felt more accessible. It didn't take so much energy. Um, I wasn't trying to do something I could sell or like I was doing it just for fun, no pressure. And uh, after a while of do doing those, I could get back to painting. Uh, but for a while, starting a big project felt too much. I, I would say that even if you don't have much time and you have a full-time job, for example, every you can start little uh, and maybe just have a website or sort of sell on, online, um, but, but it's challenging, uh, yeah. My name is Thompson Brennan. Um, I am primarily a painter, although I do also some site-specific public work um, occasionally. Um, I've been doing art as long as I can remember. Um, as a little kid drawing and that just extended itself into uh, into my later years and here I am. Constantly doubting what it is I do, but it doesn't stop me from um, doing it with purpose. So I think the seeds of doubt are really just about existence. You know, they're just all of us face those issues. Those doubts don't linger very long in me because I've accepted them so long ago as being part of existence that they almost don't impact me much at all. I have never gone to the studio and, and stared at a blank canvas and said, I don't know what to do. Um, I just do, I just do something. And doing something very quickly dispels, if I had any doubt, it quickly dispels it. Uh, and I'm into what's in front of me which requires presence. And so because it requires your presence, you don't have time for doubt. You just, you are, you are moving through the problem that you have uh, in front of you. It, it, it almost doesn't matter. Often my painting in particular is what I would call reductive. So I may put down a lot of marks and a lot of color and a lot of paint. And the very next day or the day after, um, I'm painting completely over most of it and working into it. So it's constantly in process. So I think it's really important to experiment. So experimentation for me comes from an idea that, that I'm working from. Um, I don't like labels. Most artists don't like labels, but because somebody has asked me, how I would label myself, I thought, okay, that's really interesting because we all rebel against that. So what would I label myself? And so I've come up with um, a conceptual traditionalist. <laughs> People will look, okay, what does that mean? And I said, well, conceptual is that I'm working from an idea or from uh, a political situation or from a social interaction or from a place of thought. And so the traditionalist comes in where I am very interested in using traditional media um, to express that idea. And so, yeah, so that's the moniker that I've come up with. And I, because I've tried to create a style of thinking as opposed to a specific style of technique, um, it allows me to experiment with lots of different techniques depending on what best suits the idea that I'm trying to present. Going forward into this year, I, I, it might be, I don't know, a healthy way of thinking about it if we're able to um, to see this problem that's in front of us as a liberating factor and to kind of sweep away the smaller stuff. That it, it, there, there is one thing I will say that, that I've kind of 
maybe not resolved to do, but I've understood better than ever that um, the little stuff in life, the petty annoyances, um, and you know those little petty squabbles we can get into with our siblings. When we look at this past year, we realize how petty they really are. And, and the bigger picture is that we are a one human family and we are better off if we embrace um, the wellness of everyone. I have done um, in my life uh, work that is specific to hoping for change. Um, there was a series of works um, called Gun Relief. And I was really hoping when I was working on that piece, the, the public piece called Gun Relief, and all the related pieces that I did, which are in the many dozens, um, might be a vehicle for change just through dialogue. Um, I think the real role art might have is that it sparks dialogue. Um, I never feel like my art is really complete until people see it. I don't want to be an artist who simply does work, sits in the dark. Um, it's To me, it's a communication. So if art can have a role in social change if, or political change or consciousness change, it is because it sparks a dialogue of some sort. Um, I'm always hopeful for that. Um, and art doesn't necessarily have to be pointedly political or social uh, to affect that dialogue. Um, but when it is, I think it does have the ability to spark some. How much change comes from that is dependent upon the people who are having the dialogue. My name is Jane Canyon. I live in Vancouver or North Vancouver, Canada, and my work is abstract, uh, non-objective, I would say. And I think we all get messages that we aren't good enough, and depending on when we get those messages, um, it affects us differently. I certainly had a, a teacher when I was in elementary school that criticized something I was doing in a, you know, just a kid's art class, and it's the, one of my clearest memories that I couldn't be an artist because... I wasn't going to be good enough, and I wasn't born with the genes, so, you know, that was just off the table. So a lot of it came from that, but I think that it, a lot of it is just inherent in the sensitivity of being an artist. The inner critic is much harsher than any other critic you'll have out in the world, and it's important to remember that. Um, and one negative voice can drown out a thousand positive voices, so I think you have to remember that, too. And just keep doing the work and, and keep remembering what you love about it. Keep remembering why you do it. And generally, it isn't the sales. It isn't the finished work. It's the actual process of doing. So if you can just keep yourself in the process and not think too much, um, that's really where our love of being artists is. I think experimentation is vital for me because I get bored easily. And so I always want to try something new. Um, even if it's a small thing, I always wanted to see, you know, there's always that, that voice in your head that's saying, well, what if I did this? Or something's happened that you're really excited about and you think, well, what if I did this too? It's always that what if exploration that leads to experimentation that keeps it fresh and keeps it exciting, keeps it really fun. I actually had an experience in the fall where I was really having a hard time uh, with my work and feeling really stuck and kind of sick of everything I was doing and unhappy with everything I was doing. And uh, somebody had given me some a jar of powdered graphite years ago, years ago, that had sat on the shelf in my studio and I hadn't done anything with it. So I, it was warm outside and I decided to go outside with a piece of paper and just dump graphite on and start playing with my hands. That physical action of taking a medium that I wasn't used to and just going for it and letting out, you know, painting my feelings, letting it all out, led to using powdered pigments and um, so on in my work in a new way that I'd never, I'd never used powdered pigments before. So little things like that, that just something you have around that you haven't used very much and because you don't know how to use it or you're, you know, you're kind of intimidated by it and just getting into a headspace where 
you know, not worry, not worrying about whether it matters or whether it's going anywhere specifically. I love the play periods. Um, the hardest part for me is the resolution. And I think one of the hardest things about resolution for me is that I, in my uncertainty, I go too far and I lose what was magical before that. So it's always a balancing act between going too far and not going far enough and sometimes hitting the sweet spot. I don't have a formal art education and I always feel like it's hit and miss, although I know probably it isn't, but there's always that feeling of maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, you know, maybe I'll be able to do it this time, maybe I won't. Sometimes I have to write, sometimes I have to think more than I'm comfortable with with a painting. Sometimes I just have to put it away and then it'll come out weeks or months later and I will either realize that I'm so close that I'm just ready to finish it off or that it needs to to totally change. So there's a lot of work in my, a lot of work in my studio that's in progress and perhaps has been in progress for a couple of years because I put it away at a stage that I really liked, but it wasn't quite there. I think that not having the, some of the ready answers at hand allows you to try things a little bit more easily. Than, um, and I also think, like I know people who are very good at, at formal art techniques and, and can render beautifully, which is something that I've always envied, but it's very hard for them to then break out of that and not, not try to make those renderings even in non-objective works. I think that I've been able to be looser and freer sometimes than some formally trained artists can. It isn't that I don't have any training, like I've taken tons of workshops, and I do have some guidance. I have a mentor that I work with in a group, but you know, so I, I have support around me that helps me work through some of these things. I wasn't young when I came to art, like I was, you know, older when I came to art and much older when I came to painting. So I want to spend my time in the studio, not in a classroom. My name is Sean Hunt, and I'm a Heldsuk First Nation artist from British Columbia. And the type of work I do is, um, well, generally uh, a lot of sculpture and painting. The seeds of doubt. I'd say they probably just come from some um, form of anxiety from within. A lot of times you are, uh, you know, really putting yourself out there and, um, you know, that can sometimes be scary. I'm definitely my worst critic. Before one of my paintings or sculptures makes it out there into the world, generally, um, I, I have gone over it and analyzed it and, you know, destroyed it <laughs> several times in my mind um, in order to get to the point where you're able to defend and talk about it with ease. I, I've realized over the years now, because I've been doing this for like 20 years, um, I have a sort of a, a way I go about doing things, and I'm about to do it again, actually, is um, so I don't have um, any uh, background whatsoever in watercolor. You know, it's a medium I have yet to explore. I think I did a watercolor painting in grade five, and that's probably the last time I did it. So I'm just going to take it up, uh, teach myself how to do watercolor, and then um, try to push it, push the envelope in terms of uh, watercolor as a medium in conjunction with uh, the art form that I do, and try to take it somewhere where it's never kind of been taken before. I challenge myself with new mediums and then try to bring them into the fold and then make them my own. I, I think the confidence might just come from within, but um, something to think about is is that like you don't have to show people. Like I probably won't put the first one out, you know, like and, and, unless it really works, but um, you know, you can, you should and you can spend a lot of time experimenting, you know, behind closed doors before you ever, you know, sort of, you know, feel the the, the the need to show people it's never going to look good in the beginning you know like but if you put the time and the energy into something it's going to work out i've found that over and over and over and over again that if if i want to get good at something it's really just a matter of just applying yourself and and putting in the effort there's really nothing else to it um i have had points in my career where uh you know things haven't been going so well things haven't sold so well and you know you have 
depression and things and self-doubt that creep in. Um, but the thing that, like, and this is going to sound sort of maybe a little bit uh, Hallmark card generic kind of thing, but but the thing that really keeps me going, and and this is like sort of, you know, I'm 20 years in now, and it's kept me going, is that whenever life gets really, really difficult, I realize that that is a period of growth. And so I kind of now embrace that period because I know that what's going to come out of that period is going to be so much better than where I was before. And it's just been proven to me over and over and over again. Um, And so I don't really have a problem with that anymore. Um, Now, when I'm going through something tough, I have to sort of like, obviously, you know, you're angry, you're stressed, but you step back from it. You have to step back and you have to say, hey, I'm going through something right now because I'm I'm about to grow and I'm about to shoot forward and I'm about to like my my mind and my consciousness is about to expand. So um, nothing, no growth was ever done easily. So when something's hard, it probably means you're growing. So embrace that and push through it and uh, reap the rewards when you're done. I hope you've enjoyed this visual podcast. Thank you for listening, and many thanks to all our contributors for opening up and offering such encouraging and inspirational insight. Successfully cultivating creative endeavors is a process. The ground might still be bumpy, but let's embrace 2021 and support each other to grow and thrive each step of the way.